Welcome to our discussion of the presentation on workshop on the practice of hesychasm. And for those of you who attended my lecture yesterday and those of you who are watching out in YouTube world and might have seen the previous lecture, this is going to have a very, very different tone because hesychasm is a very, very different kind of practice than the sort of intellectual practices that we most often encounter in Western Christianity. Hesychasm is a uniquely orthodox practice, and as such, it doesn't work using the same sort of models that Western Christianity has traditionally used. In fact, later on, we're going to talk a little bit about historically the Hesychist controversy that really was a controversy, a, a collision between a Western model of intellectual contemplation and an Eastern model of, of uh, mystical practice. Hesychasm, by definition, means stillness or silence. Now, <clears throat> oftentimes, there's a tendency, particularly in the West, to translate or to equate hesychasm with quietism. And that's to be resisted. They are very, very different phenomena, despite the fact that one could linguistically translate hesychasm as, as quietism. They are very, very different phenomena. And there are a number of different meanings for the word. Uh, it is sometimes used simply as a, uh, a synonym for monastic practice generally. To be in a monastic setting is to be hesychast. Uh, sometimes it is interchangeable with uh, anchorism. So the word uh, anachoresis, uh, 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 wait, uh, uh, anachoresis, I get my right. anachoresis is interchangeable with hesychasmos. And so to, to set oneself away, to close oneself off, has the same meaning as hesychasm. Its goal seems to be unified. The goal, is, the goal of hesychasm is union with God, transcendent union with God, and the vision of the uncreated light. The uncreated light is a visible manifestation of God's power in the world. And it's equated with the light that was seen on Mount Tabor during the Transfiguration. Now, speaking just for myself, the... the <coughs> story of the Transfiguration has always been one that has been especially powerful to my understanding of Christianity. And I think even long before I encountered anything like Gnosticism, that moment where we see not Christ as a human being, a teacher, a healer, a prophet, a thinker, a revolutionary, but we see Christ as a transfigured presence of God. That moment was especially powerful to me, and always has been, and I think it is that image that is in large part responsible for my journey, which led to a kind of Gnosticism. Hesychasm, or stillness, is a response to the admonition in the Gospel of Matthew. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be, as hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily, I say to you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And they fa thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The word closet is a, a chamber or a storeroom. It's a way, it's a place set apart. And I always think about, okay, what's special about the storeroom, the tamieon, that is, that we're told to go pray there? It's not go pray in your sunroom, go pray in your living room, go pray in your bedroom, because those places are private too. Right? Those places are, are shut off. So, we can make the distinction between the guy who stands in the middle of the street and, oh, look how holy I am, I'm so holy, and look at me praying, and the guy who stays at home and prays quietly. But the distinction is more than that, because the Tomeyam is, is a, a storeroom, and if you're storing things away, 
you want them not to be exposed to things like light and heat. Keep in a cool, dark place. That's what it says on, you know, anything from, from batteries to sacks of potatoes. Keep them in a cool, dark place. And so that's what the storeroom is. Is it's this darkened place that isn't open at all, in some sense, to the rest of the world. It's closed off entirely. And so when we talk about the closet into which we go to pray, we're going to be talking about uh, shutting off ourselves from the world in a profound way. So I want to look very, very quickly through the, the sort of history of the orthodox practice of, of hesychism. I've already mentioned Matthew uh, chapter 6. St. Simeon thinks of hesychism in terms of interior prayer, inner prayer, that results in a union with God beyond images. So it's a non-representational experience of God. It's not thinking about God as something, but simply experiencing the very presence of God. And it shows itself in the uncreated light. Gregory Palamas becomes one of the great proponents of uh, the practice of hesychasm. Hesychasm as a practice is centered in the monasteries of Mount Athos, and, and Palamas himself is an Athenite. In the 14th century, when he's uh, speaking publicly about the practice of hesychism, he comes into conflict with uh, an Italian monk called Barlam. Now, Barlam's kind of a, a strange figure. It's unclear whether he's born into orthodoxy or whether he is a convert to, uh, uh, to orthodoxy from Catholicism. We know that he is trained in the Western scholastic tradition. That that's his model. That's his way of thinking. So as I gestured to earlier, the idea that, uh, that hesychasm has this, this particular history puts it in very much opposition to Western scholastic models of contemplation. And we see this quite explicitly in the Hesychist controversy. So it's possible that he was born into orthodoxy and simply trained in this uh, tradition. It's possible that he was trained in this tradition and converted to orthodoxy. What we do know for sure is that after the, the controversy has been resolved and uh, Palamas has been vindicated by a number of councils, uh, Barlam converts to Catholicism and is received into the Roman Church. Barlam calls Hesychasts navel gazers. Now, the, the idea of navel gazer is kind of funny because, on the one hand, they're contemplating nothing outside of themselves. But in addition, I don't know if the video is going to catch this, the, the attitude of prayer for the Hesychast was to tuck the body in so that one's attention was fully directed inside. And so they were quite literally looking at their navels. They are quite literally looking at at the, the center of the stomach. And so this idea of, of the hesychasts as, as navel gazers, and we even use this term now, and this is something that's stuck with us, is really a, 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 an incisive kind of insult to this practice that they're not reaching God. They're just turning inward. And from a Gnostic position, of course, there's no difference. That to turn inward to the truth is to find God. And so I think that despite the fact that hesychasm has this strong history and rootedness in orthodoxy, it still is of use for the contemporary Gnostic. The claim that Barlam makes is that we cannot have that kind of direct knowledge of God. That knowledge of God is propositional that it is an intellectual, contemplative practice, that it is a theological practice. And this has been the attitude of, of the Western Church at least since the time of Aquinas. Palamas' response is 
to emphasize the restorative power of grace, to emphasize the extent to which all things are possible for God. And therefore, it's not about training. It's not about intellectual degrees. It's not about uh, book study. In fact, the AJC is often accused of being uh, an, a church for intellectuals. And I don't think that that's wrong. I don't think that that's false. It's also accused of being anti-academic. Of being anti-academic, uh, ironically. Yeah. Wonderful. Get it from both sides. Um, but I, I think that one of the things that's, that's very important to any Gnostic understanding of the practices of Christianity is that you don't need... To be, you don't need to have a string of letters after your name to be a Gnostic. You don't have to be a trained theologian or a trained philosopher or a trained psychologist. That you can have these experiences and these understandings without that propositional kind of knowledge. And the way that that's put within the Orthodox Church is that Christ made apostles out of fishermen. Well, these weren't trained theologians. These weren't people who were, were priests in the temple. These weren't people who were, were trained in philosophical traditions. These were people who were fishing for a living. And the idea that, that Christ can still make apostles from fishermen, I think, is something that is deeply embedded in this kind of practice. The uncreated light was for Palamas a direct manifestation of God, a visible manifestation of God. And frankly, this is what sent Barlam round the bend. The idea that God could be visible, that, that he had a visible and an invisible nature, or an inv a visible and an invisible quality, was to divide God, to separate him into two parts, and it smacked of polytheism. What Palamas does is argues that there's a distinction between the essence of God and God's energeia, energies. Now, this has become part of orthodox uh, theology, the distinction between the essence and the energies of God. This is something that the Roman church has struggled with and has never been able to really fully accommodate within itself. Although there are Western theologians who will argue very, very strenuously that there's nothing essential about this, this distinction that makes it inimical to Catholicism. And there are uh, Western Catholic uh, theologians who have taken up hesychism in particular as a useful practice. But at the time, this is seen as a kind of absolute rift. The essence of God is, for Palamas, an unknowable. It is not accessible to, to human reason. But the energies are perceptual. We can see that manifestation in the world. Now this distinction, this, uh, this, this way of thinking about God, pits Palamas against Balaam in an irre irreconcilable sort of way. And so ultimately it has to be turned over to the Episcopal councils. And the councils affirm the practice of hesychism. Put it very, very simply, Barlam loses, and so he returns to, or converts to, Western Catholicism. So what was Barlam prior to converting to Catholicism? Um, well, he's, he's originally from Italy, he's Calabrian, oh, yeah. um, but he is, is coming to Greece in order to, uh, to argue his point. But what was his... Affiliation prior to we don't know. Oh, oh right, okay. we don't know. He could have been a uh, he is within the Orthodox Church at the time that he's encountering Palamas, right. but he may have been a convert or he may have been raised in that tradition. Yeah, yeah okay. So he was pretty, pretty but Orthodox. he is within the Orthodox Church yeah, at that time. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. I'm, I'm not sure if he said this, but what what year are you talking about? This is 14th century. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I kind of glossed over that, so... Yeah, yeah, that's where we're talking, so we're 14th century. So the practice of Athenite uh, hesychism is already very well established at this point. So Palamas, although he's often uh, associated with uh, hesychism very, very directly, he's not an originator 
of it in any sense of the word. He is is defending a practice that has already got a, a long history at that point. In its most precise usage, or its most restrictive usage, hesychasm is about the repetition of the Jesus prayer. That is to say, repeating the singular, simple prayer endlessly so that we pray unceasingly. And very, very shortly after I started this practice on a regular basis, I take that back, even before I started it on a regular basis, when I first encountered it, I found that it, it has a way of switching the mind into a kind of automatic gear. If you repeat the Jesus prayer a hundred times even, and that's not, uh, that doesn't take very, very long. If you repeat that prayer a hundred times, you'll stop. But you don't stop. Your brain keeps doing it. You keep thinking it. And, and I think this is true of anything that you recite, anything that you focus on. Uh, there's what uh, some people have referred to as the Tetris effect. You play, you play video games before you go to bed. And you're playing your video games, and then you lie down and go to sleep. And what you see is maybe not even an image of the video game, but the whatever you're seeing in your mind is sort of structured in that same way. Well, the Jesus prayer works, I think, according to the same kind of psychological mechanism. That once you've repeated it 100, 200, 500 times, it keeps going of its own accord. It's not something that you have to consciously do. And so this idea that we pray unceasingly is taken quite literally in the practice of hesychism. The purpose of the repetition of the prayer is to shut out the thieves, those stray thoughts and sense perceptions that will come in in order to, to take us away from our contemplation and our experience of the divine. And there is almost, and I'm sure that uh, St. Gregory Palamas is going to be rolling in his grave right now, there is a kind of Manichaeanism there, that the senses are an obstacle to our encounter with, with God. That, that God has to be moving beyond the sense realm. The use of this particular prayer is, is not, uh, it's not the only way to practice hesychism. In fact, there is an earlier, uh, a much earlier precedent uh, St. John Cassian in the 4th century uses the prayer, the very simple prayer, O God, make speed to save me, O Lord, make haste to help me. Very, very simple. And I think that it is the simplicity of the prayer that is most important. We're not reciting a 12, you know, we're not, you don't do uh, hesychasm by sitting down and repeating the canticle of the sun. You, know, you, you, you don't even do it by reciting the Lord's Prayer. You do it by choosing this very simple, invocatory prayer that calls upon the name of Christ. And that's what's, that's what's important in this. And the meaning of this prayer is central. This is not a kind of... It's, it's not a, a mantra in the sort of naive sense that I think that that's often taken in the West. That, oh, you just have these syllables, you just have these sounds, and you let these sounds sort of rattle around in your skull, and then nothing, you know, you're, you're able to, uh, to focus the mind because the, there's nothing else coming in because you've got these sounds rattling around. The meaning is vitally important. But as Gnostics, looking at this, this is a little difficult sometimes. The idea that we should call upon Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, to have first and foremost mercy on us and to position ourselves as sinners smacks of all kinds of vicarious atonement. It, it, it smacks of the sort of attitude of, oh Lord my God, please see how much I suck. Please see how full of suck I am. Oh Lord, I suck so very, very much. And, you know, there's this kind of self-flagellation that, uh, you know, uh, of demeaning the self, of beating ourselves down in order to demonstrate our, our, our smallness in the face of the divine. I don't think we have to read this that way. I think we can read this with some, 
some critical apparatus still functioning and say that I can call myself a sinner without essentializing myself in that way, without saying that I am by some sort of nature a sinful person. I am simply a person who has made mistakes. I encountered a, a would-be uh, Gnostic priest some years ago who was very, very interested in this practice of hesychasm, but says, yeah, but I don't need mercy because I'm not a sinner. You know, I don't think in those terms. I understood what he was saying, that he wasn't essentially sinful, that, that he didn't want to be beating himself down. But the idea that I could make the claim that I don't need mercy just seemed unconscionably arrogant to me, just seemed to be so far beyond the pale. If we're not capable of recognizing our own limitedness and our own imperfection, then we've got bigger work to do than I think hesychasm can do. That said, I know people, especially Gnostics, who leave out the last part and simply say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And I think that that's all right if that idea of sin is so difficult for us if it itself provides a kind of, of obstacle. I don't think that that's unreasonable. But we've talked a little bit in the last few days about hamartia, about missing the mark. And sure enough, the word here is hamartalon. Hamartalon is one who misses the mark. And so I included the Greek here really very much for that singular reason, that I wanted to emphasize the the hamartia that's present right in there. In Greek, the prayer is Kyrie Jesu Christe Yeto Theo Eliason Meton Amartolon. Again, I think there is a kind of beauty in the language. I think we ought not to get caught up in the beauty of the language, but there is a beauty in the simplicity of the Greek text. And we see that there are elements of this that we're already familiar with when we say Kyrie Eleison. Lord, have mercy. Kyrie Jesu Christi, Yer Toteo, Eliason Meton Amartolon. The practice of hesychasm in its simplest form is simply the repetition of this prayer. It's simply the repeated practice of, of praying the, uh, the Jesus prayer. Now, I think that that is for most of our purposes, enough. <clears throat> Sit down. Shut up. Pray. It's not any more complicated than that. There are other aspects of it that we can bring to bear. And I don't think that they're unuseful. I think that they are, are useful practices. But at its absolute core... The practice of hesychasm is sit down, shut up, pray. This is the prayer that's generally used. As I said, there are other kinds of prayers that can be, that can be used, like that of St. John Cassian, O God, make speed to save me, O Lord, make haste to help me. I think any properly invocatory prayer to the name of Christ, and I think that that is essential, that the name is at stake, can serve as a basis for, for Hesychus' practice. Oftentimes, though, an additional sort of element of the practice that prevents the Hesychism from simply being a mindless or uncritical repetition is that you would recite the Jesus prayer ten times and then the invocation to the Theotokos. <coughs> Most holy Theotokos, save us. Iperagia Theotoke, soson imas. And I was thinking about this, this word, Iperagia, Iperagia, uh, and, and turning it around in my head, you know, and I'd always known, oh, it's most holy, and then this sort of light dawned on me that we can recognize this word very, very easily. You think about, everybody knows the Hagia Sophia, the Holy Wisdom. Hagia, there it is right there. 
And how Hagia is she? She's hyper Hagia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and that's literally what the word is. Hyper Hagia is, it's hyper holy. <laughs> it's the most holy in Pocos. <laughs> so son imas. That's strangely cooler, isn't it? It, it? it sort of is. She's, she's hyper holy. I like that. And there she is. back there. Um, so there is this practice of doing ten <laughs> repetitions of the Jesus prayer and then the invocation to the Theotokos. And I wanted to include this because, first of all, I find it uh, useful, as I said, for avoiding the kind of mindless repetition of the Jesus prayer where we sort of begin to forget about the meaning and it becomes just these syllables, but instead given the importance of the practice of nepsis or, or mindfulness <coughs> to include this as a kind of break that keeps our mind focused. And for this purpose, I like to use a good old-fashioned Western rosary. Now, the traditional practice of, uh, orthodox practice of hesychasm uses what are called the prayer ropes. And a prayer rope is simply a rope with a circular rope with a set of very specifically and beautifully tied uh, knots along the way, and you count the repetitions by moving your hands along the, along the knots. And often these prayer ropes have, have 50 or 100 knots in them. And what I like about using the Western rosary for this is that you've got 10 and 1, 10 and 1, 10 and 1, 10 and 1, 10, and then you're back to the start. And so if you count a single Jesus prayer on each bead, and then the invocation of the Theotokos on the singular bead, then you've, you've got that practice set. There's one more thing that I want to show you before we actually start doing this practice, because I do want this to be a practical uh, workshop as well, is the image of the Megalos schema, the great schema. Uh, it, is, it's a, it, it is a garment, it is a vestment that's worn, depending on tradition, either by those who are, have committed themselves to a Hesychus practice, or most often people who have given 30, 40, 50 years over to this practice. So it is a, a great reward to wear the, the megaloskema. Um, but I just wanted to, to sort of show this to you and then give a, a sort of uh, breakdown of some of the, the images and the text. So first of all, if we look at, and it, we see the spear and the sponge in the crucifixion, where the sponge is offered up to, to Christ with vinegar. And so these are both symbols of the mortification of Christ, as is, of course, the cross itself. But the cross sit, sits upon Mount Golgotha, Golgotha, the place of the, you guessed it, skull. But the skull, and this I think is a very interesting and peculiar tradition, the skull there is, and it says so right there, Adam. It's Adam's skull. It's a human skull. It is the skull of humanity. And there are a number of very peculiar traditions that say that it is, it is upon the site where Adam's skull is laid that Christ is crucified. And so we have this played out very, very specifically in the, the imagery of the Megaloschema. But there's also all this wonderful Greek text. And it's the meaning of those, that Greek text. Across the top, of course, we're familiar with this. Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ, Nika Victorious. From there on, it gets a little arcane. It gets a little... So, next is, the light of Christ shines on all. And then we've got Theta, 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 Theta. So, the vision of God, divine wonder. Theo, Thea, Theen, Thelma. A little, uh, little play on words there, uh, followed by uh, uh, kai 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 kai, Christus karin, Christianos karizetai, 
Christ bestows grace, grace on Christians. And finally, at the bottom, uh, the place of the skull becomes paradise. And so I like to have this image up. I actually have just a, a, a fairly small printout of this. I would never, uh, I, I would never uh, honor myself by assuming it. Uh, but I like the image, and so I keep the image in front of me during my practice very, very often. So the next thing that I want to do is actually just take some time to do the practice. So what I'd like to do, and we're actually moving, I think, a little more quickly than I expected, um, is just take some time to, to pray the Jesus Prayer in repetition. And I want to start by doing it aloud. I think it's very, very important to do it aloud in uh, one's initial practice. Uh, when I spoke to uh, Bishop Thomas Langley about this, he says that he always begins by praying aloud. He always starts by speaking the name. After he's done it a couple of hundred times, he brings it in and it becomes an unspoken, it becomes a silent prayer. But he always begins by speaking it. And so I've put it up on the, on, on the screen so that, it, you know, I think we can probably all remember a, a two-line uh, prayer, but, but to keep it in front of us. And no, I'm not going to make you pray it in Greek. No. Um, Come on. Although it sounds very beautiful in Greek. I mean, that's, that's actually the other reason that I put it up there. I and mean, there is this kind of beauty of it prayed in Greek. But because the meaning is important... I want us to pray it in English. I, w I was just going to mention something about the meaning because this is a practice that we do frequently uh, at St. Joe's back in, in Calgary. And you mentioned a lot of people have a problem with the with the with the end bit, the sinner. I find just as many people have a problem with the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, is you know especially as Gnostics because they tend to you know internalize the deity and have this idea that you know I'm I'm self self sufficient and all this stuff. But I think that. The idea, especially, you know, the tough phrase for some Lord Jesus Christ is, is a reminder, um, you know, going back to what Bray was talking about, that sometimes, you know, we, I guess it's, it's the difference between self-power and other power mm -hmm. um, that you find, you know, referenced in some traditions that, the, you know, we do need something. Um, well, think about what it says in our liturgy, yeah. you know, that God is both within and without yeah. also. And it's not, that's not an either or. That's a, that's a both and. Yeah. And so I think gesturing toward the external, towards the exterior, I think is, is all to the good. At the same time, I understand why it can be a sticking point. And I think yeah. that's an excellent, an, an excellent point. I'd, I'd just throw in that, I mean, Courier, from my talk the other day, the Mary, the Mary Collar talk on Friday, um, the, the dual meaning of Adonai, of God, mm -hmm. um, and of the head of the household, uh, 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 neither of which is, Lord, a particularly terrific translation into English. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. So if people have a have a hassle with that, maybe the maybe to say courier. Yeah, Christ. I I, I find that I find that it just just like the you know the angry psalms, I find it's good because it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there there there's something the angry in, psalms. I love it, that. You know it. Uh, um, mm -hmm. you, you that's know, what we the, need is a little iPhone game, angry psalms. <laughs> <laughs> you sort of put a psalm in a catapult and sort of throw it at your enemies. Yeah. <laughs> I think you'd have to be throwing it at yourself. Mm. So. Yeah. Um, so, are there any more questions before we, we actually try the practice? Yeah. Uh, I, I guess this might intensify the otherness, wrathfulness, angry goddess bit, but um, I'm interested in using the Theodicus thing rather than the, I can't pronounce it, the Trisagion. I, I'm sorry, I'm. The Trisagion? Yeah, the Holy, Holy, Holy? Holy God, Holy, Mighty, Holy, Immortal. Mm hmm. That's a big god. Yeah. Coming down on us. Yeah. Is that part of this loop, the prayer bridge loop? No, no. Uh, this uh, the standard practice is merely just these two, these two prayers, and often just the just the Jesus prayer, just the Jesus. Prayer. Yeah, now, off the top of your head, that how the Trisagion works as a practice? Is it a body prayer or? <coughs> I don't. I have to simply plead ignorance. Sorry. Can I just ask, what, what, what are we referring to with the Theotokos? Oh, I guess it'd be good to mention, wouldn't it? <laughs> Theotokos is the bearer of God. Yeah. She's the, this is a, the, the, in the Orthodox tradition, the great title of the, of the Mother of God. Uh, so when we talk about Mary 
you know, it's always Mary Theotokos. What did I do? Yeah. Oh! <laughs> thought I screwed something up. And there she is! <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's <laughs> Holy Mary Theotokos. In, in a very, very uh, Byzantine sort of manifestation. Yeah. So that yeah, so when we're talking about the Theotokos, that is an invocation of uh, the Blessed Virgin. Well do Gnostics give them do Gnostics themselves give much attention to that figure as Mary, or do they reinterpret it as Sophia? As Sophia. I think there is an incredibly wide variety of practice and, and understandings. Um, for me, uh, I, I, I distinguish the two. Um, I think that anytime we're talking about any feminine image in, in scripture, it's always hard on some level to divorce that from our ideas of, of the femininity of Sophia and the feminine manifestations of the divine. That the divine has, the divine is as much feminine as it is masculine, um, and I think that the elevation of the Theotokos to the kind of preeminence that she has in both the Western and the Eastern churches is a kind of begrudging admission of of the the divine feminine. It's you know this is the way that we're going to find it. Unfortunately, it's a way of controlling it, of circumscribing it, of saying, oh, well, it's just Mary. Mm, I think that's very, very dangerous. But uh, for us, I think that while we don't have a, a particularly strong Marian tradition uh, within ecclesiastical Gnosticism, I think that the Sophianic dimension, I think, uh, sort of feeds into that, that Marian impulse. Uh, so while you're doing this, you could be mentally orienting yourself towards the Sophia. Absolutely, I, I see no reason why not. I see no reason why not. I find that um, you know, and it might just you know be my limited perspective, but I find in the same way that um, you know the the story of Christ or you know uh, Christ him, himself itself um, makes God comprehensible. You know, something that I can put in my hands, or something I can understand. Mm -hmm. That you know, when mm -hmm. when looking at the different biblical uh, images of the divine feminine <coughs> through through Mary, through the Magdalene, that it makes Sophia mm -hmm. yeah. digestible. In the, in the same way, you know, the, there's also correlations that you have the Theotokos, the the God bearer, and you have Sophia uh, seeding the divine spark into the entirety of, you know, bearing that in, in, into the entire of you know emanation and creation. So I find that. Uh, um, you know, I do connect connect the two uh, in purpose, but you know, one makes the other more you know more more digestible for my limited brain. Yeah, I think that's a really valid point. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Why I wish don't I brought my paper. <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting outside in the lab, but I Why don't we uh, kill the the video? I don't. Uh, Are you going to do an introductory model? Are you, no, I are think you we just dive just into it. We just dive into it. I think I think that there is always a risk of sort of overthinking. It. Yeah, sure. And uh, I mean, this is a practice that anyone can do very, very easily. Uh, it is not demanding in its in its most basic form. <coughs> it's demanding only in the discipline required to maintain it. So, uh, so I figured what we would do is we would um, do a fairly ambitious run of them. Do two hundred. Um, and uh, having done that break, have lunch, uh, come back, talk a little bit about, just have a discussion about uh, the experience, a little debrief, uh, and, then, and then do it one more time.